stories, lived experiences, challenges, and how women in different corners of the world had been leading in transformation and, and justice through their organizing and movement building work. This side event is an opportunity to take stock of the special rapporteur's work over the period of his mandate, recognizing the support and his work around WHRDs and his contributions to visibilize the differentiated violence of women human rights defenders facing um, different risks while defending human rights. This side event would want to visibilize the contribution of women human rights defenders and feminists organizing and pro problematize the challenges they face in context of conflict and post-conflicts. We also wanted to take the opportunity to highlight the main demands and expectations for the next Special Rapporteur on Human Rights Defenders. So allow me to introduce to you this woman next to me. First of all, Nazik Awad from Sudan. Nazik is a Sudanese Women Human Rights Defenders. She's an executive director of the Sudanese Women Human Rights Project and a member of the MENA Coalition for WHRDs, working against the genocide war crimes in Sudan since 2004. Hasmida Karim from Indonesia. Mida is an Indonesian women human rights defender from the Sulawesi province and initiator of the Young Women Activist Forum, or FAM, composed of 300 plus young feminist network across 40 provinces in Indonesia. Luz Marie Rosero Garces <coughs> from Colombia is a Colombian communicator, leader of the Maho Afro-Colombian Communities Process, defending the rights of the Afro-Colombian population. We have Fatima Bentaleb from France. Fatima is a feminist and anti-racist activist working in France. She is the vice president of La Love, a feminist and anti-racist organization that defends Muslim women's rights and makes their voices heard. Also with us is Leslie Ramirez Argueta, human rights defender, transgender, intersex, LGBTI rights, women and diverse women defenders. Leslie is a nurse and independent consultant on reproductive and sexual health, and is a sex worker. Now we will be hearing what are the different key issues that women, feminist human rights defenders are facing in their countries, and what are the initiatives and strategies that they build around in order for them to build protection and strengthen organizing work and their movement building. So let's start from Sudan. in Sudan. Um, in Sudan in 2019, we have seen a um, massive uh, women human rights defenders movement uh, on the streets um, protesting to change one of the most um, uh, um, hostile uh, regimes against uh, human rights in the world, uh, a regime that had committed the first genocide in the 21st century. Uh, and therefore in Western Sudan. So women human rights defenders in Sudan have been protesting, not just changing the regime, but also they, they were um, letting out all of the anger, out of all of the oppression that they faced for the last 30 years, um, living under what we uh, call the ISIS regime in Sudan, the Islamic State in Sudan, uh, which has started since 1989. And uh, Sudanese women rights defenders 
where um, the main um, uh, 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 um, fighters against uh, this regime for the last um, 30 years, um, they faced all sorts of uh, um, sexual violence and torture and uh, detentions and unfair trials. So um, uh, after 30 years of oppression, uh, Sudanese women uh, had found uh, the um, protest in 2019, the opportunity to go on the street and finally get rid of uh, uh, the oppression that they were living under for the last 30 years. This has been happening uh, in, with the same scenario uh, from Sudan to Iraq to Lebanon uh, to most of the uh, countries in the MENA region recently where women are taking the streets, um, leading the uh, uh, government changing uh, uh, from the front line, um, also facing all of the oppression. Uh, in the protest in Sudan, we have lost uh, 11 women in six months. And um, in, at this point right now, the main issue, I think, for the uh, WHRDs in Sudan is um, to hold ground and also to seek justice for all of the uh, women who have lost their lives, who have been tortured, who have been uh, sexually abused, uh, either during the revolution or during the last 30 years. It is also the same uh, situation that we can see happening in uh, many of the um, region uh, uh, of the North Africa. And there are both uh, from, as I said, from Lebanon to Iraq to Yemen to um, Saudi Arabia, where also women are detained because are, they are just suppressing their opinions, either for the indigenous groups like what we uh, see in Namibia or um, the, the LGBTQ rights as we see in countries like Kenya. So we also find that they should be losing their lives. But at the same time, um, uh, the best charities, I think, in Africa, in Sudan, in um, the MENA region, they are also um, building networks and uh, changing the narratives that's victimizing uh, women uh, by uh, setting the agenda, by standing up for the oppression, and by taking the streets and showing up every day and encouraging others um, uh, to, um, to, to, to protest against all of the oppression we are facing in this. And the example in Sudan was very inspiring because all of the protests in Sudan were starting in the 1 p.m. exactly for six months. And all of these protests were just starting what we call the Bruta, which is um, the woman shout, which is what um, in many other occasions was used in either marriages or in deaths. But uh, women, the feminist movement in Sudan had transform um, this voice of women to be the call for freedom and for the protest. And I think this call is uh, loud enough to change uh, a regime, and it is changing lots of things in Sudan, and it's also changing lots of things in this region. Thank you for the opportunity. Thank you. I'm uh, Mida, uh, and I'm from Venetia. I think I can start with the uh, situation in my country. And probably I'll explain a little bit what's happened in uh, around Southeast Asia. So since the uh, uh, political uh, narrative rising in Indonesia, they use the uh, religious uh, they use the religious fundamentalism issue as well, uh, taking the negative impact on uh, the woman's life. The impact is not in uh, not only in political but also social and uh, economy. This uh, religious fundamentalism is bring the negative uh, narrative to the uh, women's uh, movement, uh, not only in Indonesia, but also in the Southeast uh, Asia region. According to the National Commission on Violence Against Women in Indonesia, in 2009, there were 400 thousand uh, cases that increased uh, from the last year on a woman uh, experiencing uh, violence based on uh, genders. 
The part of the victims is not only students, but also women activists. And the most common violence is the sexual violence on women and girls. So this situation is not isolated with the uh, situation in our uh, neighboring, part, uh, neighboring uh, country, such as Thailand, Philippines, the Cambodia, and Myanmar. The common, the common threats and threats are <coughs> following is the impunity, <coughs> impunity for uh, repressions and violence. This is uh, only uh, this has happened not only in Thailand, Cambodia, but also in Thailand and uh, but also in Philippines and Indonesia. The second one is the criminalization and attacks on acti activists, all time activists, but also students not only women human rights defender, but also the students who are uh, do a protesting on the uh, corruption. Law, the, the third one is the law to restrict progressive NGO and the uh, uh, grassroots organizations. There are new restricted uh, registrations on, of the organization, like uh, freedom of expression and assembly, especially in Cambodia. Thailand, Indonesia, and the Philippines. Increasing pollution and corruption between state and non-state actors. And then the last one is the use political narratives to promote and justify extractive and economic uh, project as a positive development and to portray the resistance as a backward. So, because I'm from uh, Farm Indonesia, uh, in Farm Indonesia, where I'm volunteering for, we are promote the uh, community organizer uh, and organizing in terms to raising the uh, community awareness. And then uh, we also create our safe space as a political safe to build our strategy in the movement building and then to build the trust. So I think that's all that I can say for the first, and then probably we'll have a discussion on what the things that happen in my regions and context in Southeast Asia. Thank you. Thank you, Mida. So from building movements in Sudan to building safe spaces as political space in Indonesia, let's hear from South, uh, South America and how women are navigating in the context. Buenos días para todos y todas. Este ejercicio lo hicimos con la compañera chilena. Eh, es un ejercicio que intentamos recoger algo de las realidades de América Latina. Entonces, digamos, un primer elemento que construimos es que hoy la situación de políticas extractivas de América Latina de los gobiernos de América Latina están generando una afectación en todo el, todos los recursos naturales que tenemos en los territorios. A partir de la defensa de ese territorio, eh, las comunidades y los pueblos se vienen alzando, vienen protestando contra la minería ilegal, contra el derecho al agua, porque el agua es un regalo de la naturaleza y creemos que eso no se puede privatizar. Venimos luchando eh, en contra de la forma como se están utilizando los recursos naturales en estos territorios de Latinoamérica. Y creemos que esos son bienes sociales y comunes para todos y todas. En ese sentido, digamos, a partir de eso, los pueblos y las comunidades que reclaman están siendo efectivamente, todas sus acciones de movilización están siendo militarizadas, no solamente las movilizaciones de masa, sino todo tipo de movilización legal o todo tipo de protesta que las comunidades hacen están siendo criminalizadas. Esto genera que en las comunidades hayan desplazamientos, eh, hayan asesinatos a las comunidades. Esto genera también, digamos, desarraigo, discriminación, 
a las mujeres y a los pueblos sobre todo cuando, y los jóvenes cuando, cuando se empiezan a movilizar son hombres criminales eh, los gobiernos ubican situaciones como por ejemplo eh, que los ESMAP que son la fuerza pública empiece a reprimir a las, a las comunidades y además hay asesinatos en todas estas situaciones y esto está generando que la protesta y la forma de defensa de derechos se convierta en, en un crimen para los gobiernos y creemos que es un derecho para todos y todas digamos, eso está pasando en distintas partes de Latinoamérica en Colombia, Bolivia, Ecuador y Chile Digamos, Chile, la protesta de Chile empezó desde octubre del año pasado, del 2019, y se mantiene hasta la fecha. Es una muestra de que los pueblos hoy no estamos conformes con las políticas, con el modelo de desarrollo que los estados están planteando. Pero además de esta situación, está toda la situación de violencia contra la mujer. Que en ese contexto, y en otros contextos, la situación se vuelve mucho más crítica porque las mujeres hacen parte de toda esa dinámica y le han reprimido a la mujer el derecho a decidir sobre su cuerpo, el derecho que tiene la mujer a vivir su propia, su propia vida. Eso ha generado feminicidio, ha generado desplazamiento en las mujeres y se le ha señalado perdiendo, digamos, todo su proceso identitario y digamos, la desterritorialización. Eh, esto, cuando hablamos de la defensa de los derechos, yo vengo de un territorio muy pequeño al sur de Colombia, que se llama Tumaco. Ahí estamos viviendo distintas situaciones graves, viol violaciones masivas de mujeres en comunidades rurales. En el, 2000, en el 2016, una violación masiva de seis mujeres en su zona rural. Y esto el gobierno no ha pasado nada, no, no sucede nada en la zona urbana de Tumaco, en algunos barrios como el barrio Once de Noviembre y otros. Las mujeres tienen que salir a buscar a sus hijos en medio de, de confrontaciones de grupos armados, de la FARC y de los paramilitares. Toca salir a buscar a esos muchachos porque uno no sabe en qué momento empieza el enfrentamiento. Y es genera mucho terror y miedo con las mujeres y uno que es defensor de derechos humanos le toca a veces sin saber cómo ayudar a esas mujeres cuando les toca salir de sus hogares a medianoche o con miedo o ir a buscar al grupo armado para que le vuelvan a su hijo ya sea muerto o vivo pero que se lo devuelva digamos esta situación es para nosotros es muy fuerte y son muy complejas y lo que pedimos sobre todo es el tema de la protección, de la protección de las mujeres, la protección de los territorios, la protección de los pueblos, porque defender un derecho hoy se ha vuelto un crimen. Defender el territorio que nos han heredado nuestros ancestros y nuestras ancestras se han vuelto un crimen. Y creemos que eso no es un crimen, estamos seguros que eso no es un crimen, eso no es nuestro territorio, es nuestra vida. Por eso creemos que en el caso de de Chile, lo que estamos pidiendo es que pare la violencia contra los pueblos que están defendiendo y están reclamando. Hoy hay 30 muertes en, en Chile por la defensa de esos territorios y hay alrededor de 400 mutilados, pero también en Colombia el acuerdo de paz no está funcionando para la gente. El acuerdo de paz, el gobierno no quiere generar, generar estas políticas que las comunidades estamos pidiendo. Y también estamos pidiendo que las mujeres tengamos los espacios para poder construir lo que queremos y como lo queremos, como mujeres negras. Y finalmente es decir, gracias por estar aquí, pero también es que ustedes empiecen a generar también con sus gobiernos estrategias para la protección de las mujeres y las comunidades. Thank you for sharing. Now let's hear from Mesoamerica. Buenos días a todos y todas. 
Mi nombre es Betty Ramírez, vengo de El Salvador. Es un gusto estar aquí con ustedes compartiendo el trabajo que realizamos las mujeres defensoras a nivel de Mesoamérica. Como defensoras mesoamericanas, hacemos frente a una situación de desigualdad que afecta principalmente a los grupos poblacionales históricamente excluidos por condiciones diversas, la pobreza, disidencia sexual, etnia, color de piel, género, entre otras. Respondemos también ante el no reconocimiento de la diversidad humana o su reconocimiento formal unido a la inexistencia de normas excluyentes y discriminatorias que impiden el ejercicio de los derechos ciudadanos para la mayoría de la población. Las defensoras mesoamericanas nos enfrentamos a Estados que a través de instituciones y funcionarios responden a los grandes intereses económicos y al crimen organizado, lo que deriva en altos índices de violencia generalizada y con mayor impacto en las mujeres diversas. Como es conocido en los medios de comunicación, vemos cómo ha aumentado el índice de mujeres asesinadas y desaparecidas a nivel de Mesoamérica. Estamos siendo utilizadas como un motín de guerra. Y estos son conocidos como crímenes de odio, feminicidios, transfeminicidios y violencia sexual que va en aumento. También genera represión estatal frente a quienes reaccionan ante las violaciones de derechos humanos agrediendo, criminalizando y asesinando a las personas defensoras de derechos humanos. Como los casos conocidos como Berta Cáceres, una defensora hondureña, defensora del medio ambiente, asesinada por sicarios, enviados por la empresa privada y el Estado, cuya justicia sigue pendiente. También tenemos el caso de Amaya Copen, es una estudiante nicaragüense, Defensora que es detenida arbitrariamente, encarcelada dos veces y tiene juicios pendientes de delitos que no cometió. Los altos índices de impunidad en la región mesoamericana, la represión de la protesta social y el cierre de los espacios cívicos impide avanzar en resolver esas causas estructurales y políticas que mantienen a los países de Mesoamérica en una permanente irregularidad e inseguridad en todas las esferas de la vida. Ante esa realidad, las mujeres mesoamericanas, defensoras de derechos humanos, construimos redes como espacios de alianza, buscando mayores resultados en el trabajo que realizamos en los territorios. Asimismo, las defensoras requerimos del reconocimiento de nuestro trabajo y el aporte en la defensa de los derechos humanos de los riesgos a los que nos enfrentamos y los impactos que ese trabajo tan arriesgado tiene e implica en nuestras vidas, en nuestros cuerpos, en nuestros territorios. Y es por ello que precisamos de una protección. Las redes también nos sirven para desarrollar nuestro trabajo de manera segura y con acompañamiento. Apostamos a una construcción de espacios feministas de sanación y acompañamiento en situaciones de riesgo y de vulnerabilidad, que a diario enfrentamos las defensoras, como por ejemplo la Casa de la Serena, que se ha puesto a la creación de espacios físicos para nuestra protección y sanación. Muchas gracias por escuchar. Thank you so much. Now we've heard from different stories, usually lived experience from women human rights defenders in the southern context, but that here specific story that women here in Europe, particularly in France, the challenges and, and the context that they are facing. Hi everyone, uh, so I'm Fatima from France, and I would like to draw your attention on this recurrence and this violence of this Islamophobic polemics that has uh, been very, very present in France lately in the last past month, um, years. Uh, is very dangerous for women because it, it looks that excludes them, sorry, from work, from education, from activities, from sports. Muslim women are depicted as oppressed, uh, they are stigmatized, isolated, and isolated from society. 
and they pay the heavy price of these policies of denunciation, which is discrimination in hiring, laying offs, discrimination in, in education, access to activities. So according to the Defender of Rights in France, Jacques Toubon, in his report published in 2018, the fact of wearing a veil still constitutes a factor of discrimination in employment. And he also points out that the wearing of the veil or bikini for sporting purposes cannot be prohib prohibited on the basis of secularism or rule of majority. So I don't know if you just told what happened in France lately. There was this law which wanted to ban Muslim women wearing a veil mothers from accompanying their children during school outing. So the 2004 law which prohibits veil in school cannot concern, cannot be applied in any case to adults who are neither pupils nor um, employees of the national education system. So beyond Islamophobic practices, the wearing of the veil in the school uh, setting by voluntary parents does not represent a threat. So this constant um, focus on Muslim women wearing a veil um, creates a, a, a kind of terror in France like Islamophobia is becoming a real source of insecurity for Muslim women and Muslim in general. Fighting against this veil in a democracy like France, in European societies, would not liberate oppressed women, but might instead lead to their further alienation. And also this legislative grip on Muslim women is a kind of undeniable manifestation of Islamophobia and misogyny that currently occurs in Europe and in France in general. So this construction of oppressed women is majorly under, um, created by media and political politics. In October 2019, there was 86 debates and 200 interventions and television about veil with zero Muslim women invited. Muslim, women Muslim are widely invited and expressed. They are depicted as weak, oppressed, without any agency, and that's the problem in France. So we are deeply concerned by this media treatment that paves the way to a fertile ground for violence and discrimination against them. So beside the media depiction, there was also the political and European level, uh, Islam, and approximately there is 20 million Muslims who live in, the re in Europe, and there is this myth of an ongoing Islamization and invasion that has been nurtured by extreme um, populist parties in Europe. So it's very dangerous to, to pay attention to this and how people make a link between this and um, Muslim women wearing just a veil in France and living their life. So there is also um, all this fight against the girls and, um, that leads to an exacerbated Islamophobia with one million people in turn in uh, China, Muslim men in the United States, the Rohingya genocide in Burma, the lost nationality of Muslim in India. So this fight of Islamophobic discourse created a, hate, a harmful climate that has the dramatic consequences in France. So as political activists and feminists, we are supposed to defend the rights of all women, whatever their religion or origin, sexual orientation. Feminism does not consist in silencing the voices of certain women, nor in homogenizing women's struggle, but in respecting the plural identities and needs of each woman. So in France, we launched an organization to create a safe place for Muslim women where they can empower themselves. We have more than 200 volunteers in this association and more than 50,000 people impacted by this. We created an online magazine to make Muslim women voices heard. We organize events to have a political expression and political action as well in France to express our ideas and to show people that we are different from what people say on Muslim women television and in political debates. Thank you so much. What we've heard are different stories from their um, experiences from uh, the struggle for respect uh, on diverse identities of different women, bodies as our first territory to defend, assertion of our right to land, safe spaces, organizing safe spaces as political space, and mobilizing voices and visibility as key component of how we are building power and protection amongst us. So before we get questions from our audience, this 
stories that you've heard are one of the many stories that have sparked inspiration of a report that was conducted, um, report that was created by the UN Special Rapporteur, Michelle Force. And it's, um, and we are excited to announce that through that report, we've created a manual, manual by and for women activists and human rights defenders designed to strengthen our collective power and protection. This is created by Just Associates in collaboration with, of course, the UN Special Rapporteur Michelle Force and with the support of International Service for Human Rights, Kalala Women's Fund, and the Central American Women's Fund. This has inspired, like their stories that you've heard, from women activists across the world that have met and engaged with the special procedure. This manual, and I will just distribute it, maybe you could just hand it out, seeks to celebrate the interconnectedness and solidarity of women and feminists around the world being part of a global women's movement and connected through our struggles for social change. This manual also seeks to contribute to a greater discourse and understanding an analysis of systemic violence faced by human rights defenders and how they built collective and feminist protection strategies based on knowledge and experience in specific contexts in different parts of the world. It also seeks to help women human rights defenders identify different ways in which the UN Special Rapporteur Michelle Force report on women defenders can be used as a resource for advocacy and analysis to enhance their collective power and protection. So the manual is designed using feminist popular education as a, method as a methodology to be accessible and useful and engaging to women human rights defenders in different parts of the world. It also offers tools to assess risk, power dynamics, individual and collective vulnerabilities, strengths and challenges. It has combined exercises, activities, readings, and discussions. And we are welcoming your feedback offering you to use this, and as you use it, we welcome your feedback on how we can strengthen this process and how we can strengthen this tool to better support women human rights defenders that are at the front line in defending human rights. So this is the soft launch, <laughs> but we are very welcome to hear your feedback. This is our journey together and we will incorporate all the learnings that you will be distilling from this process. And one of our commitments is to create a consolidated version based from the experiences and feedback from women human rights defenders in how we can, we can better um, strengthen the tool. And of course, provide suggestions and maximize the mandate of the next special rapporteur to be able to support women at the front line. So, questions. <laughs> we'll now entertain, we have a few minutes. Um, you can ask questions from what you've heard. Um, you can entertain three questions. Yes, please. Um, as women human rights defenders, what would be your priority for the next mandate holder of the Human Rights Defender Special Rapporteur? What would be your one to two priorities that you think they should really focus on to further this work um, that Michelle Force had done and also just maybe gaps that he hasn't seen within the women human rights defenders work? 
I'm Susan Wilding with Civicus. Well, um, from my personal experience, uh, I think that one of the um, uh, places that we need the next profit group to look at is um, women human rights defenders who are working in the grassroots levels, um, who are not accessing all of the resources and uh, the support and networks and protection networks, but might be available for uh, the disabilities who are um, well connected, well known, uh, either regionally or uh, internationally. And those uh, women's working at the grassroots are defending very important uh, issues, um, uh, indigenous rights, cultural rights, uh, land rights, uh, environmental uh, uh, issues. And uh, they are facing um, uh, crackdown everywhere. Um, the um, other point also is that I think that we need also to focus more efforts on, on not just um, providing um, protection for the disabilities, but also providing more resources for building their capacities. Um, because the, ro the roles of the disabilities are also becoming uh, more challenging, uh, especially in um, countries in transitional situations. Um, where um, the uh, protection might be not just, um, um, uh, it's not um, enough. Uh, we need also to build capacities so that the disabilities can tackle the issues related to engaging with decision making, changing policies, uh, building um, uh, uh, feminist and women movement that uh, could also um, participate in not just um, uh, demanding uh, uh, um, uh, uh, demanding the rights, but also creating the agendas themselves and pushing them to be at the top of the agendas of decision makers. So um, these resources are needed to be provided and the building of the capacities of the DHRDs uh, is I think very, very important so they can be monitored also uh, for the change that they have participated in making. And this is one of the challenges that we are facing right now uh, in our situation in Sudan in the transitional period. Um, also, uh, a very personal experience for me is I had uh, a WSRD who has been exiled for more than eight years. I think also WSRDs who are living in exile are also facing so many challenges uh, including their situation sometimes as refugees or asylum seekers, and they need also uh, to have an special focus on, on what uh, the challenges they are facing uh, living in Western countries, and sometimes they are also facing uh, double threats from two, three countries, not just one country, and this is uh, something that I have personally faced. Uh, so these is are some of the issues that I think we need to focus on, but in general, I think that we all want to work and um, on the main issue of protection, but I think from a different perspective, which is, I don't think that we have focused enough on, uh, which is putting the perpetrators uh, who are committing crimes against the WHRDs accountable. Uh, they should not be free. Um, the work of WSRDs should not be a choice of putting our lives at risk. It should be um, a work that risk free so that we can really make the changes that we are capable to do. Our colleagues here in Kenya who are defending the, the rights of LGBTQ have lost 10 women in just four months being killed. In Sudan, we lost in six months is 11 women. So all of these women, the justice for them is very important to end the risk for other women. And this is also very important because we need to understand that the work of WHRDs internationally uh, is not just related to women rights. 
what we are doing in Sudan, in the MENA region, in Africa, we are actually changing governments, changing laws, changing lots of things. So we are not just defending women's rights, we are defending human rights, we are creating changes, very big changes, but even heavy for our soldiers to take, uh, and, um, and even to guard, and this is actually the most important challenge for our movement in Sudan right now is to guard the changes that we have already reached. And we need to be um, more, we, we, we need more strength to tackle all of these issues. Uh, and justice and transitional justice uh, um, in conflict, post-conflict situations is very important to empower all of these uh, women, human rights defenders. It's also encouraging for other young defenders to join the movement and uh, in situations where we have revolutions like Sudan, we have thousands and thousands of young women who are joining the movement and uh, they are keen to have more information, more capacity building, and I think we need to provide that for them. Los Estados de los Américas tienen una deuda histórica con las mujeres defensoras. Los crímenes de violencia hacia las mujeres están en aumento en nuestra América y defender derechos es un reto, ¿verdad? Es, es peligroso y lo que necesitamos como defensoras de derechos humanos es el reconocimiento de nuestro trabajo, que sepan que armarse de, de poder, de salir a defender lo que en realidad no tendrían por qué defender porque es algo que todas las personas por el hecho de ser humanas tenemos y tenemos que ser reconocidas. También el reconocimiento de las diferentes, de, de las defensoras diversas, ya que el, los, no se toman en cuenta ahora con los nuevos movimientos de mujeres trans que estamos incluyendo ¿no? a las luchas de las mujeres, porque también somos mujeres y el ser mujer no es un cuerpo, sino un sentir el empoderamiento que realizan las mujeres defensoras a las mujeres en los territorios y el riesgo que esto implica llegar a los territorios donde hay índices de violencia muy alto, donde nos desaparecen, nos descuartizan y los, la forma en la que somos asesinadas es con un, una hazaña bastante elevada. Que den credibilidad a, aquellos, a los aportes que presentamos de la, de la realidad que vivimos nosotras las mujeres. Que se, que se crea en lo que nosotras estamos presentando. Asimismo, que la impunidad y los crímenes que se dan hacia las mujeres defensoras se resuelvan, ¿verdad? Que, es, que no queden impunes, ya que el, los estados siempre se cubren unos con otros y el trabajo que nosotras realizamos queda, queda desvalidado y perdemos nuestra vida. Muchas gracias. questions I think well uh, in my experience having approached to the uh, country uh, leaders in terms of not producing the law or the regulation that control women's studies or in Indonesia now uh, the religious fundamentalisms they are not as you know, a hidden actor on our uh, political uh, situations, but they're also becoming a visible power through the political parties. So when they are coming to the powers that they are more power, they will control a woman with uh, their regulations. And now in Indonesia, uh, some of uh, legislative uh, members who are also women, is proposed the new bill that controlling uh, and uh, define that good woman it should be like this, this, this. Compared to other uh, country in Southeast Asia, uh, the use of uh, individual rights that try to control by the state is also uh, taking people and women to access the uh, resources in the economy. For instance, in my uh, city, uh, there are new regulations that the uh, Indonesian government is trying to produce on investment. Uh, 
uh, which is taking uh, open more widely the investment from foreign country, while it doesn't really think to the young people on access to the works and the uh, jobs in, in, in the country. So what I'm suggest here that we are, you see, you can see the, uh, when, the uh, when the people with the conservative mind on the power, they will control individual uh, women, uh, especially they are right. Let's see in India or in other uh, country that they are, uh, have a conservative uh, mind. They are trying to control the minority, as same as happened in Indonesia. Uh, they are trying to not let people uh, express their uh, rights, like wearing things, they are trying to control or define with what you wear. Or even they control your food. Uh, what you will bring on the table. So I think that's one uh, uh, approach or strategy that the new uh, reporter could uh, do in terms of uh, her power as the new uh, reporter's uh, next. And then the last one, yeah, probably already mentioned by my friend, that the priority, uh, the second one is the uh, woman human rights defender is also uh, need a protection. So uh, the last one that I'm saying that the uh, conditions that I uh, did explain it, I already write it down and maybe later I can disseminate it to you all. Thank you. So in France, the main challenges we are facing is um, we want a total shift in the political paradigm tackling anti-discrimination laws, which are currently counterproductive. So we wanted to recognize Islamophobia as a reality in France. Uh, we want strong measures to be taken by politicians and by the judiciary against Islamophobia. So this goes through this political paradigm and the fact um, to put the first persons impacted by this racism at the forefront of the debates and not dealing without them, but put them at the core center of the politician um, laws and of the, the media debates that are occurring on, on them. Um, another fact is the end of cyberbullying that targets activists, artists, and all people dealing with Islamophobia. So the lack of resources, and especially financial resources, to rob association that fight against Islamophobia. And more specifically to address the issue of mental health and the impact of racism and sexism and Islamophobia on the mental health of Muslim women. That's all. Bueno, yo quisiera plantear en América Latina hoy la movilización es parte de de la construcción, o diría bien la desconstrucción. Y la, todo el sistema, los gobiernos está ahí, hoy, hoy están en función de reprimir la movilización. Yo creo que todo apunta al tema de, de desarrollar mecanismos con los gobiernos de que, de que la movilización es parte de la vida de las comunidades. Y si las comunidades están inconformes con los gobiernos, es un derecho movilizar. Entonces, ¿cómo se, se construye, digamos, herramientas con, con los gobiernos para no vetar la movilización. Creo que todo, todo lo que hemos dicho aquí va hacia el tema de protección. O sea, yo creo que el punto central es la protección de los derechos y de la posibilidad que los pueblos defiendan sus derechos. Also in replying to your question about what it's important for the next reporter to take on, on uh, we, we think as well that it would be important that um, take into account the legacy that Michelle is also, um, has given to women human rights defenders over the years is in some practices that we have also helped to build within the mandate and the collaboration that women defenders have been uh, given the, the space within the mandate to have, like the consultancies, um, specific safety spaces for women defenders 
during the country visits, either being official or academic visits. Also, some things that would be even more important to stress more than that Michelle has already started as well is the relationship, close relationship and joint actions with other special rapporteurships and mandates within the HRC and the High Commissioner. And as well to keep also uh, the focus on the specific thematics reports on WHRDs. I think um, the, his last report from last year was paramount um, on surfacing the situation and violence of WHRDs around the globe, but then, you know, putting more stress on thematic um, situations that are affecting women defenders.